me and my friend started to learn to wheelie because it was just one of those things before we had nothing better to do. I got a Stanton steel frame, UK built steel frame, like well, one of the biggest mental challenges I've found with mountain biking is trusting the tyres. It's got a lot of fans, this door. This door's pretty famous. Hello, single track listeners, and welcome to another single track podcast. This week, we're going to pretty much dive straight into one of Hannah's little pet projects here at the podcast. It's the Desert Island Disc Brake Series. And this week, we've got a kind of a very, I don't know, unusual, interesting guest. Who is it, Hannah? So, best known as Jake 100. Uh, he is part of the uh, bike life wheelie urban riding crew um, that you might have seen on Single Track World or you might have seen on Instagram and probably on TikTok as well if you are a youth. You're, uh-huh. just, too, you're just too old, Mark. <laughs> right. Yeah, as soon as you mention TikTok, that's it. It's like, that's, that's, <laughs> That's that's me out of the equation. So what kind of stuff does he do? What is this urban riding of which you speak? So uh, people have often seen uh, these riders kind of wheeling around London in particular. Um, and they, as well as riding on their back wheel all the time, they do things like the swerve, which is where you ride towards something and you get as close as possible and then swerve at the last minute. And that might be around a bus, for example, which is perhaps where some of the attention um, gets caught. Because people so think, oh, they're the, weaving in and out of traffic. Definitely do stuff that, that we... dangerous? That he could, so he could definitely do stuff that we all wish that we could do. Yes. That, that's, where it, right, that's where we're coming from. So where would people have seen him already? Because we've actually published some stories on this. Yeah, so... Um, <clears throat> We have published some stories on bike life, um, wheels up, knives down. Um, there's a there's a sort of a regular meet up in London um, that the sort of whole crews come out and ride together, and it's a bit of a festival kind of a thing, really. Um, so there's that that we've published some stories on, and um, he also did a speed record attempt while wheeling down a mountain um and that that youtube video was very popular and that's on the website as well cool so we'll we'll stick some links into the podcast notes so that people can go check out some of the stuff we've done but let's not spoil it all let's head straight over to your interview and uh oh well uh, can i interrupt before you do oh go on by all means that might have painted a picture of uh irresponsible and wild youth that kind of wheeling and um riding in traffic and that kind of thing and actually uh i think that a lot of what jake talks about is the same love of bikes and riding bikes as we all have and um he had a lot of insight into stuff i was really really impressed talking to him about how he thinks about things so great great well take it away hannah and jake Hello and welcome to Desert Island Disc Breaks again and today I'm joined by Jake O'Neill, better known as Jake 100. Hi Jake. Hey, how's it going? All right, yes. Now then, I don't know how much Radio 4 you listen to. You're probably a bit young for Radio 4. I I can't remember the last time I tuned into a radio. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, So Desert Island Disc Breaks is a shameless rip-off of Desert Island Discs um, okay. on, on Radio 4, where we, we we talk through your life through the medium of bikes, um, and uh, and then we wash you up on a desert island, <laughs> or an island, you, it might not be a desert island, where you'll have to spend the rest of your days alone, apart oh. from the company of a single bike, and a helmet, and a toolkit, and some trail building tools, so. It sounds quite blissful, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see where we get to in the chat. I wonder whether you'll be needing a shovel as a trail tool <laughs> or indeed a road roller, because uh, you're a little bit different to some of the other guests I've had on in that you know, we're a mountain bike magazine, but we love all bikes, and you ride urban uh, bike life, wheelie 
uh, swerve and all that sort of thing. So uh, that's where our readers may have seen you before. Yeah. Uh, bit different. Yeah. <laughs> Just a tad. Just a tad. So, um, so when did you learn to ride and what was your first bike? Oh, so I learned, I, I've learned to ride a bike since, since a kid. My dad had, my parents had me on a bike since two, three years old. Um, yeah. um, and then, yeah, like literally growing up, always loved bikes. My dad used to ride motorbikes. So I'd always see him coming out of the front garden on the motorbike, looking super cool and stuff. Um, and then, yeah, we'd just ride bikes, going on little bike rides with my mom, my dad, like proper little cute stuff. And then, yeah, as time went on, I got a BMX. Um, right. I'm always that, envious of people that, that have BMXs because they always have all the skills. Right, that was all <laughs> I wanted. Suddenly it became about tricks. I was a, I was an avid footballer on the side. Football was my, my goal, my dream, my passion. It was, if I, if anyone asked me, what do you want to be when you're older? professional footballer and right. honestly there was there was a chance I would have made it as a career like there was a good chance with the level I was playing at and the mindset I had and how dedicated I was to football but there was something about riding bikes that never allowed that career to kind of blossom because once I got on a BMX that's when the injury started to come <laughs> I was gonna say it's not good yeah. for your knees <laughs> Right, I've had three operations on my knee, literally talking about that. But, um, and then yeah, that's kind of like when I, I started, but obviously, yeah, I've been riding since since a baby. But when I, I would say I started riding and taking it real serious was probably teenagers, right? When I was a teenager, that's when I was like riding constantly, meeting all my friends on bikes, with doing little meetups, with just going to the skate park, and yeah, I would say about 12, 13 years old for that. And so lots of our listeners are more familiar with kind of the benefits of mountain biking, the experiences you get there and, mm. and the friendships you make. So what is it about the bike life and urban riding that makes you tick that got you just like, nah, not football, it's bikes? So, yeah, so when, so once I'd torn my ACL on the BMX bike and I completely destroyed my knee and football was kind of like, it's kind of in the past already it's been a year and a half two years of recovering knee injuries re-injuring it getting it back physio do you know what um and once that football was out the window and I'm now on a bike and I now haven't got a focus like in London like I'm chilling my local area and this this was now once I'd recovered from the knee injury and I started riding a mountain bike around my local area and just being out and about and trying to go to the park and be outside and be outdoors. That's when I had a year or two of, you know, getting in bits of trouble and kind of doing the wrong things and being influenced by the wrong people. Um, But then there became a point in that period of me kind of being a bit lost, like no football, not big on education. Like what do you do as a young person, right? Mm -hmm. Me and my friend started to learn to wheelie because it was just one of those things. Boy, we had nothing better to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so we just learned to wheelie. We saw some of the older guys from the local area. They would wheelie their bikes to then started doing like little tricks to it. We got quite good because we were all like me and my mates. We came from the BMX background. So we had a bit of understanding and standing about the tricks and, and that side of thing. Then for some reason we started posting on Instagram and then at that point I'm about 15, 16 when I've started posting videos on Instagram of my wheelies. And that's when suddenly my friendship group and my whole world kind of opened up because now there was other young people similar age to me doing the exact same thing in their areas. Right. But like, you know, cause we like, we'd see the older guys wheeling and we'd want to learn, but now where we're younger and we've learned quicker and whatnot, we're connecting over Instagram now. Um, And then my friendship group just became a lot bigger. It meant that it was the first time apart from football where I I made friends outside of my local area. Um, And then for me, what that meant is at the age of 16, 17, when my friends are getting in deeper and deeper trouble, you know, making, like really wrong decisions and whatnot 
I was just trying to go ride my bike and meet up with all these other friends that I made and mm-hmm. film loads of videos and do some exciting bits and get my our adrenaline rush and our kind of blood pumping through riding and through tricks rather than all the other stuff that, you know, my friends back in my local area were doing. Mm-hmm. So for me, it kind of just, yeah, it really opened my world and kind of gave me a whole new community yeah. that, that we built together. And yeah, it was a, a, a major, major blessing. So um, you said it was Instagram that let you kind of mm. meet people outside of the street you're on kind of thing yeah. in the first place. So um, do you think that... Uh, think it's like there is maybe maybe there are now maybe it's grown but do you think that um those kind of community building opportunities or like just being able to see that other people are out there that are like you that are on your street is that like harder in your scene than maybe other bike scenes where you see it on the telly all the time yeah i think i think for us obviously doing the wheelies and stuff there was no one there was no one for us to kind of look up to. There was no one, like when I started winning, there was no, like, there was no thing in my head that thought I could make a career out of this, right. in a sense, right? Because I was like, it wasn't even a thought because there's no professional wheelie events. There's no professional wheelie riders. There's no, you know, there was no community. Well, so so the, I guess like historically there was like Hannah's Ray and Trials Riders and stuff yeah, like that. But, but did that not just I'd never heard your of them. world? I'd never heard of them until I became aware of Danny. And then I right. still hadn't heard of Hans Ray until three or four years back when I'm like really in the bi- like bicycle industry and scene now. Do you know what I mean? But back in the day, like I was, we was, I was mainly aware of BMXers. I didn't know right. any mountain bikers. The only guy was Danny McCaskill because his videos were absolutely viral 10 years ago. He was probably one of the first, he was a big inspiration, but even then, I didn't have a trials bike. They're quite expensive. Do you know what I mean? It's not, none of my friends want to do that stuff. Like, so I guess, yeah, wheeling, it was never, like, I had no dreams about it. But then as soon as my Instagram started to grow a little bit and my friendship group started to get bigger and people, more and more new people were kind of reaching out to us, wanting to come and ride with us, that's when I had, like, a thought in the back of my head, like, okay, cool, like, I could probably make something out of this. Mm -hmm. Like, and my dream was always to be working a job and a few days a week riding my bike. Like, it was work four days a week, a job, and three days a week riding. Like, that was my dream, dream, right? (laughs) And, yeah, it kind of went way past that, but, yeah, we'll save that bit. That's kind of interesting that, I guess the algorithm or or the algorithms of the internet have overcome something that Mm. the bike industry has somehow failed to do. Like somehow the bike industry has failed to speak to kids in London or whatever. Yeah, the the cities, yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess, so you're you're sponsored by Collective Bikes, obviously. Um, Um, Yeah. And um, and Collective Bikes is what, like, a desirable name in in the bike life world and like the riders that's a brand that they look up to mm. are there any of what the brands that i would know that are also making it onto that like oh that's that's the desirable list um yeah there's definitely do you know what it was like before before collective came came around um when when the scene was still fairly new and and it's you know, there were no brands, there were no sponsors. It's like there were the the bikes that, you know, everyone wanted, which were when we were youngest, the specialized ones, you know, as a kid specialized was just like the golden brand when we were right. younger. Um and then there's the brands like a lot of guys like Boardman's, even though they came from I think Halfords or whatever, a lot of the mm-hmm. kids in London liked Boardman's, a lot a beginner bike that everyone would ride or a lot of young people would ride were B-twins because of the decathlons in London yeah. or, or the Carreras. And it's quite funny because I made, I noticed this thing once where it's like, depending what area you were from, you'd kind of end up on the same bike because if you had a decathlon in your area, the kids would end up getting B-twin bikes. 
if you had a Halfords in your area and not a decathlon, all the kids were getting Carreras. So each area kind of had their own little bike, depending on the bike shop that they were in. But I think now the desirable bikes, there are a lot of desirable bikes, but my bike, the C100, it's the best bike in the world. So <laughs> for people to desire something else, then, you know, wouldn't be the, the smartest thing to do. But yeah, um, the C100 is literally designed for wheelies um and it was the first mountain bike designed for wheelies so i think that just helps create it create that attraction and you know mm. it's the kind of go-to bike for if you want a wheelie now so, so what is it about the is it the geometry or is it the build spec what is it about it that makes it great for wheelies yeah so obviously i've been riding different bikes throughout the whole throughout the year so I had a 26 inch specialized P street for a while I had a service and tough tracks which was a 27.5 I had SC bikes like the big ripper BMX bikes I had all these bikes but I would switch through them all the time and then I got um and then I got a cross country bike I got a Stanton steel oh, yeah. frame UK built nice. steel frame like um Big, that was um paradise cycles once i got a job in a bike shop and i really learned about bike brands in the industry the guys there were like you need to get the eight by three steel and <laughs> what well, yeah, felt went for it um and got a cross country hardtail 29er and i loved it like i thought it was great it was one of my favorite bikes now and i was like wow from a brand i've never even heard of like before two months ago um got this bike got quite a buzz from you know my followers that ain't really guys <laughs> like the kind of older people that follow me were quite hyped that i'd got a stanton uh -huh. it was quite cool um and then off the back of that there was certain things about that frame i was like oh it'd be great if the seat could go a bit lower like the seat tube was a bit shorter and it uh, it was great if i could have the front end a little bit more aggressive and the right. back triangle just a tiny bit shorter so there was little things like that that I'd thought of. And then by some, by, yeah, some coincidence, a, a few months later, um, someone from Collective Bikes reached out to me and a conversation began about making my own uh, mountain bike designed for wheelies. Um, so we kind of, those kind of ideas and tweaks that I had for this bike that I was in love with then, we then put onto a new bike, done three or four samples, get some, didn't like it, we'd send it back, we'd get a new one. I was like, uh, I don't like the the gear holes hanging on it or something. Uh -huh. We'd send it back, I'd get a new one, and then we came to the, the final C100. And yeah, the geometry plus the parts that we put on it, I think between that kind of makes it, yeah, the ideal wheelie bike. Uh -huh. um, and now it's, it's sold worldwide and the kind of, it's gone, it's, it's gone bigger than me now I have people coming up to me talking about the bike and they have no idea who I am <laughs> which for me is the best thing in the world it could like I'm, I'm over the moon walking away when that happens I'm like oh. it's like the best thing that so yeah it's just it's been a crazy journey with the bikes well and I do I, I do appreciate that part of the ethos of it as well is keeping it in an affordable attainable kind of price range as yeah. well i think that's that's yeah because the bikes ain't the cheapest but there was a, like i've made sure and even now with my clothing line everything i do because of the community i come from and the people i grew up around and i know how hard it is for certain young people and and whatnot and you know and how unattainable something is when it is just overpriced or quite expensive mm -hmm. it's like there's that side to me that I can't attach myself to something that's a ridiculous price or super expensive. Like it's just because, yeah, it just doesn't feel fair to everyone, you know, I'm working with or grew up around all the young people that I'm looking out for. And then I'm just there promoting and trying to sell a product that is just unattainable that they're going to really want. So I was very keen and that's why we made the, the stock model which yeah admittedly hasn't got the best parts on it but it meant that we can get it to a fair price point and then that's why we made the pro model which has the the rock shock forks it has the better saddle it has the better pedals mm -hmm. um and it has those two those two options there yeah i think the pro model is like is it about eight 
Nine, it's 900 quid. 900, 900 quid now. Yeah. So, after after Brexit and all of that, you can blame Brexit. <laughs> Happily, yes. Don't blame me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's still like, that is like the bottom entry point of a lot right. of ranges in other brands. So, right. I said, yeah. I said, my bike can never be more than a thousand pounds. That's what I said. Never. I'd never um, let them sell my bike for more than a thousand. That was my. Oh, okay. where, I, where I put my foot down, yeah. Well, I don't want to jump ahead, but I'm going to come back to that in a mo. So. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, uh, what was the first bike that you bought with your own money? My own money. My own money would have been a specialized P Street. No, big ripper. It was a big ripper. My first ever wheelie bike. My dad bought for me after a motorbike crash. He got compensation. And then it was around the same time I had my knee injury. So I had to ride a mountain bike for right. physio because I could put the seat high and thing. Mm-hmm. So that was selling some tough tracks. Then two years later, three years later, I had the first bike storms. I won the first ever bike storms. I won about 300 or 400 pounds from the competitions, from winning the competitions there. Mm-hmm. And then that's when I bought, next day when I bought a bike, when I bought an SE bike and was one of the first riders in the UK to have a SE bike. Is that, was that one the, um, is it like big a ripper. cruiser? Is that yeah, like it's like cruiser big BMX, bars, 29 inch wheels, one gear. So it's yeah. literally like a BMX on steroids. Like, yeah. Yeah. Nice. nice. It was fun, but I cracked the frame and abused it a bit too much. And yeah, I moved on from that quite quickly. Okay. <laughs> um, and so uh, which other riders and creators do you admire? or look to when you're developing your tricks so on a on like a personal level like who i kind of inspired by and stuff um it's a weird one because there's like this what so i get this question here and there and um my answer kind of it changes i guess over time because for me building my own building my own style of riding and kind of having my own look to my riding and, and my whole brand in general from content, the way my content looks to the way my Instagram is to the way my YouTube videos are edited. I always understood you can't just copy someone and try and do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, so what I would do is, and what I still find myself doing to this day is I take little bits of inspiration from 10 15 different people, right? So when it came to vlogs, I loved watching Casey Neistat, who's a mm-hmm. big blogger in New York, nothing to do with bikes, but there were certain things that I loved his little time lapses and how he set the scene of the kind of si- the shots of the city and the skyline and stuff. So I'd mm-hmm. take that element and add it into my YouTube video. But then I'd see like a BMXer doing double foot can-can, like where's both his legs over the side of the bike. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, all right, let me try and do that whilst I'm wheeling. So now I've taken that trick from this guy, content ideas from this guy. All right, now I look at someone like Nigel Sylvester, the BMX rider who's gone straight into the fashion industry, has got to deal with Mercedes, Montclair, Beats, wow. Nike. He's got his own Jordan shoes. And I'm like, wow, I want to have elements of that journey in my life. So I need to make sure my brand is super clean and on point and I'm, you know, I'm working with young people, I'm doing well, and I'm, you know, I'm working as an athlete too. So then I'm taking elements from him. So to answer your questions, there's not really one person I could tell you in particular. Um, it would feel unfair to be like, yo, fair, this guy No, that's fair me. enough. Like a good, a good mixture of influences. Yeah. yeah. And, oh, there was and a, then, few, a few of the tricks that I've seen you doing that, especially with like the wheel out ones, and you did yeah. one with a, uh, like a, I don't know if it's a chain or a rope or something. You're like flipping the wheel up in the air. Oh. Your friends like a skipping rope trick thing. No, and it was obviously was a... you were doing it like again and again yeah. and again. That really reminded me of like um, Tate Ross Kelly stuff where you're just like, how do you even think of that? He's so. incredible. So he's a big, so when it came to those tricks, 100%, he would have been a massive inspiration. And me and my best mate who we'd do it with, we'd be there scrolling his Instagram like, all right, cool. He's bounced his wheel like this. Let's, let's try and bounce it like this or let's, Let's do it together. Like, let's mm-hmm. add a person. So it's like, that was a prime example of the kind of mindset I have. It's like, all right, we saw that, but like, all right, cool. I love it. 
looks interesting, looks fun, but how can I add my own bite life twist to it? And then for me, that means I've always kept my style unique. I've always been an innovator in, in my riding and, and content within the scene because yeah, you're just you're taking the best bits from everyone and trying to do it yourself. So yeah. And so obviously there's loads of effort mm. and like trying again and again and again to get something to come together with, with some of the tricks. Yeah. But before that, before you get on the bike, is there yeah. also like gym time and training as well? Or is it just sweet wheelies and swerves and you just get out there and play? So <laughs> up until last year, it was wheelies and swerves and just get out there and play. Um, but with a serious kind of tone to it, though, do you know what I mean? There's certain days where, cool, we just go out and have fun and we ride into London, we get something to eat and we pop some wheelies, have fun and go home. But there were other days where it's like, OK, we're going to go to Alexandra Palace, which is the big hill. And mm -hmm. it's a really steep road. And we'd ride, we'd do tricks down it, ride up it, tricks down. We'd be there the whole afternoon, four or five hours. Um, so there were days where we'd, you know, focus on progression of tricks rather than let's just ride through the roads and have a bunch of fun. Mm -hmm. um, so last year, last year I started training though. I started to take, you know, switch into more of an athlete mindset. Cause I'm like, all right, cool. I've progressed so much trick wise and how I ride my bike. But now like, once again, it's like all these professional athletes that I look up to, they all train in the gym. Mm -hmm. Why am I not training in the gym? Will training in the gym improve my riding? That's then a question I haven't got an answer to. Yet. I had to find out. So I've started training, started training in the gym last year. And now I'm just focusing on calisthenics now and right. no, not in the gym. So I did a gym work for a year and now I'm doing calisthenics. Um, and luckily right down the road from my house, I've got a beer, like a little, a mini pump track right next to a uh, calisthenics park. So right. I'll be training that. and riding every morning for an hour or two. I ride the track and train and then I start my day. Yeah. Mm. So, well, if you know, even if it doesn't make your bike riding better, it should reduce your injuries. Exactly. Um, yeah. But to be honest, I felt it improved my riding in a sense. Like when it comes to 180s and doing like big hop tricks or jumping up ledges, like my explosive power and stuff that I now have is definite, definitely 100% improved a bit. Mm -hmm. 100% and I feel a bit lighter I was a bit chubbier because we'd we'd be riding just eating fast food and all that do you know what I mean so yeah to kind of have a bit more of an athlete mindset mm -hmm. I don't know you feel happier as a person I think you just feel you know even if you do nothing for the rest of the day you've still do, you've still done something so yeah. yeah it's never never a bad thing to go out and train and how much off-road riding do you do do you ever well i, I know that you do a bit because exactly. i've seen you at chick sons but yeah. yeah um i'm getting into it more and more I, I like how do i say this i don't want to be a wheelie kid forever do you know what i mean i, I don't even look at myself as a wheelie kid because i've got so many different things going on now mm. but on the outside a lot of people will look at me as oh he's he's a wheelie kid or whatever and like dirt like mountain biking i've always wanted to do mountain biking but when I was young, like, even when I was young, I'm not saying like my parents wouldn't have supported that and helped make that happen because I was blessed to have really supportive parents. So they probably would, but it wasn't even like, it wasn't even like an option like yeah. that. And then also the bikes, yeah, the bikes were just way too expensive as well to kind of get into it. Um, so yeah, maybe they wouldn't have supported the expensive bike, but they would have taken me mountain biking, but it just wasn't even an option, right? So now where, I'm blessed enough to kind of have my own van. So I literally bought a van, I bought a mountain bike and I've started going at it a bit more this year. Um, but I am looking to take it a lot more seriously soon. Like I am looking to, to kind of really start dedicating a lot of time to it, like soon. And really like, I really, like really and truly, I really want to race a mountain bike race and All do right. that. Like, I want to compete. World. Hmm? watch yeah, out watch well out. you've got all the skills so. yeah i'm coming and and i think it would be interesting just to see how 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 and if my skills transfer over from riding on the streets because i've got all the little bunny hops i've got fast reactions you know i'm good at dodging past poles and cars and whatnot so <laughs> like i'm like there's elements where i'm not coming in 
completely oblivious to how to mm. do this and, and oblivious to the skills and the, the tricks I need. You know, I've got a little bit of a starting platform that definitely hopefully I can I can elevate from um you just need to figure out which bits of mud are slippy and which rocks are which rocks are slippy and that kind of stuff don't you? <laughs> for me one of the biggest or one of the biggest mental challenges I've found with mountain biking in the bits that the, the few bits I've done is is, is trusting the tires mm -hmm. that they're gonna grip on those corners because for me I ride fixed slicks which have absolutely no grip on the tires at all they're completely yep. slick tires and I ride them on the streets with no loose floor and no bank turn. So then when I'm flying out of turn, that's loose mud I ha and I have to trust these tires to not slip. That's the bit that I find myself having to like get over mentally. Yeah. Like, I think we're all still struggling with that, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, good. I didn't know if that was just a me thing coming from street riding because I see big guys absolutely pinning it around these turns, and I'm like, yo, yeah. my head is like, you're going to go flying. <laughs> yeah, the bit that gets me is the line, like the gap between the center tread and the side tread, and the idea yeah. that you've actually got to lean it further to catch that side tread. And yeah. like, there's actually like a gap between where you, you have less grip if you don't go hard enough, kind of thing. Oh, and that, yeah, see, I don't know this stuff. <laughs> freaks yeah. me out. <laughs> no, but see, I, but, I've never even yeah heard that stuff. So, yeah. but I'm you old. would, uh, you should go and ride slick rock, slick rock in Moab because that all your slick tires there would would grip beautifully. Oh, Where's that in Utah? In Utah, yeah, because you were out there. I was you? there last Rampage. year. Yeah. But yeah. the worst thing is when I flew out there, I put, I brought my mountain bike and my C100. I brought both bikes. But for some reason, I put different wheels in each bag. Right. And then only one bag came. So I only had half my mountain bike. But I, had I to saw ride you still no managed to wheel. ride it. You just <laughs> yeah. rode around with no front wheel. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> so that was one of the things I wanted to ask. What bike was that? Because that's a full suspension bike. Yeah, so that bike is um, it's custom, 101. Brand so is unknown. Oh. Oh, okay. we keep it a mystery. It's a, a secret bike. Jake so 100 it's... special. Let's just say, we'll keep it out of that one. Okay, because uh, I was wondering whether <laughs> Collective were, were prototyping a full suspension Potentially. Bike. There's, I can't say too much. Oh, there's okay. talks about there's talks put it this way there's i'll say this there's talks about supporting me whether it's them or whoever there's talks of people supporting my mountain bike journey and kind of really getting behind me to kind of help me mm -hmm. get into into downhill racing basically so i'm hoping yeah hopefully if if i can work out and and learn to organize my life and bike storms and everything else and my clothing line and everything else i've got going on Mm -hmm. I'm hoping to yeah really dedicate and then cool. give it my all mountain biking and then I should have some good support hopefully so yeah because you said you don't want a bike to cost more than a thousand pounds and that thousand pound full suspension bike like there's a gap in the market there at the minute because they used to be the the boss nut caliber boss nut and then ah. it's kind of dropped out and so there's a gap in the market there for that like at entry level accessible to loads of people thousand it's interesting that's why you said it yeah because obviously yeah. i know my mountain bike is going to need to cost more than a grand it's not going to suffice to what i'm trying to put it through if, if it's costing less than a grand but that is a good idea it was, it was amazing. So I, I live near, not so far from Leeds Urban Bike Park, yeah. and you could go there, and there were loads of people on these Calibre Boss Nuts as their first suspension bike, and it's it's like super heartwarming to see. Collective, yeah, they need to get on it. So They need to get on it. And, and with me going into mountain biking, I obviously want to try and, when I can, bring the community along with me, you know, so yeah. there's, there's talks and stuff that I was talking about with May and whatnot um, about yeah, like how can we set up a project where we get a coach and we take 30 kids from London to Bike Park Wales and we have them stay there for from Friday till Sunday and we let them go on the trails and we give them this experience that, you know, you would never get being from London and open their eyes to, you know, 
this other side of bike, mountain biking and mm-hmm. better their skills and better their understanding and also build a connection between the two cultures because I feel like there's still a bit of a misunderstanding at times between between cultures and stuff. So, yeah, it's, hopefully I can kind of, yeah, really get dug, yeah. in on the, dug in on the mountain bike stuff. So, cool. yeah, we'll see, yeah. How, we'll see how it goes. Now, you uh, obviously went out to Rampage to watch that, which I'm very jealous of because I really want to go. I was supposed (laughs) to go last year. I didn't get there. I'm trying to get there this year. Um, And uh, you were, like, talking about the risk and reward uh, of Rampage. (sighs) And uh, it seems like your 100 kilometer an hour wheeling uh, has a fairly, (laughs) like, stiff risk-reward ratio going on there. So what what kind of things do you prefer? Do you prefer the, like, skillful, artful tricks or uh, does the risk-reward thing? As in so, personally for me to do yeah. or for me to yeah. watch? For you to do. Personally, yeah. The, for me, my favourite stuff is it, it, it really revolves around speed. So it's like, okay. for me, the faster I go on my bike, the more dangerous that is, the bigger, the steeper the hill I could find. You know, San Francisco is one of my favorite places because right. you're bombing down these hills. You've got to get your friends to stop the junction at the bottom, but there might be a car coming past and stuff. So for me, that side of things, I think just because it's also what I'm good at, um, it's also kind of part of my style that really stands out in my riding is how fast I go when I do everything. Right. But then when it comes to aesthetically, like going to Rampage and watching that stuff, it really takes your breath away, um, kind of watching that and seeing it in real life. So, it, honestly, I would love to be able to do it. Mm-hmm. It would be my dream. I'd much rather be able to jump off that massive cliff than go 100 kilometers an hour doing a manual. Like, as fun as the manual is and as crazy as it was, and that whole trip was a blast. I've always, like the rampage stuff. It's next level, isn't it? Like, yeah. it's next level. So. Yeah, watch those knees if you're working on those tricks. <laughs> <sighs> Not okay. Knees. Well, so we've been super positive in all the chat first uh, so far, but mm. there is all. I think there is always a sad point in anyone's bike career. And what was the first bike you had stolen? My first bike I had stolen. The first bike I had stolen was a little mongoose BMX. Left See, outside everyone the remembers shop. it. Everyone yeah, remembers everyone remembers it. their first bike. Yeah, that got stolen. Yeah, it was a little mongoose BMX. Got stolen outside, um, just outside my local corner shop. Yeah. Just left it outside like an idiot, got stolen. And then the bike ended up on one of my friend's road, but it was all sprayed gold, tires, rims, bars, frame. And we got it back in the end, but yeah, it was a it was now a gold, was gold bike. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least you bike. were reunited. Yeah, I've got a fresh paint job as well, so you know, I can't complain. <laughs> yeah. And so you obviously grew up in East London where mm. I think things like storing a bike just the, like can be a barrier to access. Like not everyone's got a no. garden and a shed and a garage and stuff like that. So no. um, do you think, like, obviously you're very young, but even in your lifetime there has been stuff done in london to improve bike infrastructure so do you think it's got better or do you think there are still just as many barriers to getting on a bike well uh, i think there's as many barriers still but i feel like barriers the barriers for entry entry develop as well as as well as them trying to take it away it also develops as well so like obviously they've added all the cycle lanes and all the kind of one-way street systems for the bikes and you've got little bike lock things on your road but I don't see that actively encouraging people to start riding to be fair though the cycle lanes to be fair for for you know people not kids not trying to get into wheeling and stuff you know just the average kind of commute and whatnot I feel like the bike lanes have increased that over the years from the stats that I've seen, it has increased riding. Honestly, though, the best thing for the cycling infrastructure in London was lockdown. Right. <laughs> like, it was COVID, to be honest. You never saw more people riding bikes just before, just after COVID. We, we, I never sold as many bikes as I did. So, mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. But I feel like, yeah, there's always barriers and they, they're always trying to do things. But mm. I don't know. I think it's deeper than that. Well, because I often think that um, the best way to get into bikes is to discover the fun of bikes. Right. And like infrastructure is the sort of the stuff that comes next. Like once yeah. you've already realised that you quite like riding a bike, then you want to go somewhere on it. But yeah. you've got to have places where you can play as a kid, yeah. like a safe space that's traffic free and, yeah. you know, like pump tracks are brilliant examples of the kind of infrastructure that do that. So, um, but then a lot of the like wheelie bike coverage that you get is, oh my God, look at them riding so close to buses or yeah. whatever, or you're riding on a station for like a train station outside the train station. Stuff. Yeah. So I wonder how much kind of conflict you experience when you're out riding. Yeah, so honestly, it's a good point because it's sad because if anything, I hadn't thought about that point about like the whole safe place for for people like young people who want to have fun on the bike. Mm. If anything, those places have been taken away. You know, the skate park I grew up at got knocked down last year, completely right. knocked down. And that was the one that got me into riding and gave me a place to go every day rather than chilling on the local estate or in the park mm. with my friends smoking weed. You know, we could go to the skate parks. And this place like that got knocked down, which is actually really sad to to see. Um, but yeah, like day to day and, and riding now, like like that, that platform that outside the train station, Pudding Mill Lane, where we ride in Stratford. Yep. Zero conflict. Oh, that's is, Absolutely. If anything, I've had the council reach out to me saying it's amazing to see so many people go there on bikes. Is there anything we can do to support or help? So right. it's nice that we've turned a point in our culture where people understand how positive the councils, people, the media, everyone now understands how positive and how how key our culture and community is for a lot of young people. So that platform in Stratford, um, uh, outside the station that we ride, we have absolute zero trouble. We'll have police coming onto the platform and filming clips to show their kids or whatever of us doing tricks with no front wheel. We had police coming up to us in lockdown. I'd spent most of my lockdown was was spent there. One of my lockdowns was yeah. I've spent more time there than at home probably. I was there all night, every single night, riding, practicing. And police would come up. They'd call us tricks. They'd oh, we saw you guys yesterday. You're here again. Like we actually had no problem. And then I think when it comes to the road riding, you know, and touching touching on the point about like, you know, young people getting close to cars and all that stuff. And that can obviously potentially cause, cause conflict. But I think in London, especially, I think in some of the rural villages, you might get a bit of a different reaction um, because it's a different culture. There's less mm -hmm. things going on. But in London, it's like, you see us and we're gone. You know what I mean? By the time you're even mad at us, you're still sitting in traffic. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we're down the road, around the corner, getting a drink at a shop, and you're still like, wait. That's one of that life's greatest just... pleasures, isn't it? Riding past the traffic jam. <laughs> right? And and people just being mad that you're on a bike, but like, you're never going to see me again. I'm already gone. So you might as well. So I think, like, honestly, like, back in the day when we first, first started riding and we was riding around London, there was a bit more like a clash in a not heads but like the police didn't understand it so we'd get stopped week in week out stopped and searched because they they thought 10 kids riding around in tracksuits doing wheelies oh they must be thieves they must be right. snapped like they must be stealing phones they must have be on stolen bikes like that was all they thought at that time back in the day the media we had newspaper articles uh, gang of hooded youths terrorizing the streets, and we're like, what? Like for us, it was a whole like, it was like that was like the complete opposite of how we were looking at it, right? And and honestly, it was those situations that made me start doing vlogs on YouTube, um, right. because vlogs for me was the only way I could get out our perspective. Right. We haven't got a newspaper that writes to to the whole country, but I can have a YouTube video that can potentially go out to the whole country now. So we can now show how much fun we're having. We can show why we're doing it. We can talk about it. We can, you know, explain situations. We can show our skills off. And that's literally why I started YouTube. And honestly, now 
the love and support we get as riders in the city, I would say is 80% positive, 80, right. 85% positive to 15% negative. And even then, I wouldn't even know if we're getting negative support. You don't like, because as I said, by the time you see us and you're, and you're annoyed at us, we're gone already, right. you know? So we don't even have that situation, but I'd be lying if, you know, we didn't have a car driver shout at us every now and then, or, you know, so police tell us to chill out a little bit. But day to day, yeah, We all like, get that on crazy. our way to work anyway. Whether, exactly. Whether we're commuting or we're not on our mountain bikes. Yeah. Well, maybe yeah. there are some lessons. That's interesting that, like, putting your story out there in your words. and That like, was why I started vlogging. Yeah. Yeah, completely, mm. like, hands down 100% the reason why I started vlogging. Because I saw these articles and I was like, nah, it's not fair. Like, that is literally, as I said, like, we... Ha I didn't even think that was a way, like, that was a possibility for newspapers to write. Like, I never expected us to be in a newspaper for a bad reason. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I'm like, what? So, yeah, we started vlogging and doing these challenges. And then that's when we built a massive audience. And that's when everything kind of took off and led to led to the Nike deal and whatnot that I had okay. and stuff. Um, and, yeah, even touching on that, I saw, I was, I was doing um, research online because um, I'm, creating all these uh, decks and presentations about bike storms so I can reach out to brands and talk to the brands and, you know, get some support. And I found this article online from, from the police, a report, I think it came out a year or so ago. And it was actually a report about what they called bike storming is what they called <laughs> us lot wheeling through London. They called it bike storming. The, the groups of young people bike storming and skateboarding in the city. And it was a report literally saying how the police turn a blind eye when they see it, when when they see kids wheeling and whatnot. Um, and it was due to the fact that the police understand how positive and how good it is for these young people to, you know, get out of the area, go into central London and do that. And um, the police also admitted that as much as you might see these negative comments online or complaints, none of them are turning into 999 phone calls. None of them are turning into, yo, this kid just, smashed my mirror or hit my car or this kid just hit someone or or he stopped like none of those complaints or negative comments you see online are actually turning into yeah 999 calls or anyone actually taking action yeah so then which then also reinforces why i take all those negative comments with a pinch of salt like like you could be anywhere in the world never experienced, never learned, never watched any one of my vlogs and you've commented that, like, how can I, you know, accept that as a negative comment? I can't. I'll just look past it, you know? Hmm. That's um, um yeah. So, well, on your island that we're going to send you off to. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you get to choose your island. You get to design it and play Oh, God. no. Okay. Yeah. So, you, you said you're going to go in for mountain biking. It, but then are you going to leave the tarmac behind? Are you going to, are you going to have an urban island? Like how, what are you going to design? What's it going to look like? Oh, damn, that's a hard question. I would, honestly, my, my island, first off, I'd call it Hondo HQ because it's Jake 100's HQ. It's going to be my headquarters for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, you know. Is this going to be Bond villain? kind of island or tracy island <laughs> no i think mine would be a mix of you know it will have some bond villain elements but i would say in a positive way you know in a welcoming you know nice looking way i would definitely have some trails though a hundred percent have some trails mm -hmm. i'd have a dirt drop like a dirt drop line that i would just build bigger and bigger each week so i okay. had to go bigger next thing you know i'm doing them hundred foot jumps hopefully hard mm -hmm. line style would i have time what can i have tarmac and dirt jumps you can yeah oh my god i'm having tarmac but i'm using all the sand on my desert island and building it in a slant so I, my tarmac can be slightly downhill okay. and i can have a nice little downhill strip on it downhill tarmac strip with a nice corner at the bottom for me to like swerve around some dirt jumps and like a half pipe. Okay. I think I'd Everything. be good to go. Yeah. Good. And then um, obviously so... a C one hundred. 
<laughs> oh, well, we'll come on to that. So okay, cool, cool, uh, yeah. you said you'd want to be able to dig your dirt jump bigger every week. So I think yeah. that probably answers my question, which is you can have someone go and build everything for you or you can build your own. And you're saying you'd like to build your own. What? Does that person who builds them for me live on the island with me? No. No, that's it. And they build yeah, it and then that's it. You're stuck with it. That's it. You can't change it. But all the effort of building is gone and you just have to ride. But I'm like, oh, yeah, no. Nah. I'd rather just have no contact and just freestyle myself, I think. And yeah. just, yeah, because then it's yours, you know. You can be proud of it after. You can, you know, you can fuck it up and it doesn't matter. Like, oh, I swore, yeah. sorry, if, I, if that's not allowed. <laughs> um, but, yeah. I think I just freestyle. But yeah, tarmac strip, slightly downhill. That would be first number one priority would be that with a nice little flat corner at the bottom. Perfect. Oh, mm. Yeah, okay. like not 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 cambered, not cambered, it's gonna be flat. See, you're gonna have to learn some some berms in uh, mountain biking because flat corners are usually our enemy and Yeah, not good, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean, but that's what you... I'm saying, like that's what I'm... That's why you I learn the berms, then you're going to burn us all. <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. So is there a, a bike that you have lusted after but never actually owned? Oh, yeah. Pretty much any any e-bike. Oh. Yo, I just want an e-bike. A full suspension e-bike, downhill e-bike, whatever it is. I just want one, to be honest. I lost over there. Yes. A yeah. few of them, a couple of a couple different ones. I just want one. You know, I went I went riding um with Win Masters one time, mm -hmm. um, in the south of England somewhere, mountain biking. Um, this was a couple years back, and he was just wait. He wasn't even on the e bike, but <laughs> I rode one of his e bikes. But I just remember that day he wasn't. He's so fit. What? The, he's so like he was just absolutely smashing me too. But yeah, I rode a couple of e bikes. I've rode one of his e bikes before, um, and just going mountain biking with an e bike, I think it looks like a game changer. To be honest, mm. so it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know which e bike I'd want specifically. I just want a fast one that isn't too heavy. Yeah, any e bike really. Okay, well, hold that thought. Because we're going to okay. come, to, come oh. to bikes again in a moment. But you're going to have a lot of time on your hands on this island all by yourself. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. So what skill do you think you might learn? It doesn't have to be a bike skill. But you're gonna, yeah, how are you going to fill your time? What skill? I think bike skill-wise, if I was to learn bike skill, that's why I said the jumps and I'd make them bigger each week. Because... Mm -hmm. I think that's where one of my weak points, especially when it comes to the mountain biking and, and the dirt riding, is the gap jumps. Yeah. I'm still not the biggest fan of them. So I'm like, that's why if I have my own desert island and I'm there on my own with nothing to do, I can just build a small gap jump and just make it bigger each week. Just dig out the middle, make it a bit bigger each week. So I definitely learned that. And another skill, what would I learn? I guess I'd have to learn bike mechanics without any tools, right? Because well, if my bike's broke, I'll get a mechanic. Do one, once a year, they'll come and visit. Wow. And you can choose something. I can choose you, my mechanic as well? Task, they'll do one task for you. One, I can choose my mechanic as well? Yeah, but you don't. they're not going to live there, so you can chat no. to them briefly, but then they're going to have to go away again. That's cool. Bike Shack. My guy, Bike Shack Layton. Plug right. him in best bike shop in East London, maybe even the whole of London, I'd have him come down and then fix my bike for sure. But what skill, I don't know what other skill I'd learn. I feel like I'd have to be on the island and in the situation to understand what skills I need. I guess I'd need to like climb trees so I could get like food and, and, and stuff. Right. Or I'd have to learn how to make a vial out of like whatever that thing is, that Thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 some kind of like survival skills. Survival skills. Yeah. I'm trying to ride my bike for the rest of my life, Hannah. So, <laughs> I'm gonna need to survive on this island yeah. to to be able to to do that. So, yeah. yeah okay. Just survival skills. Now, unless you're... unless you're gonna send me a chef as well, then. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. 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 Stuck uh, there. <laughs> okay, okay. Just the so mechanic. you only get to take one bike to the island to ride forevermore. Now you have just expressed quite a strong desire for an e-bike. Yeah. But 
what you know you've also said quite a strong desire for the c100 so yeah what are you going to choose for one bike forevermore and how much time <laughs> how much time do i oh yeah the gap jumps of the c100 is not the mess how much time do i have to prepare my uh bike before i go to this desert island there Oh, you can have the bike like sweet. It it will be exactly as you want. It could be a bike, of, an imaginary bike of the future. Oh yeah, I think I'd make the first ever or second ever because there has been one before. Electric C one hundred. Yeah. Yeah, we'd make an electric one and take it over there for sure. Okay. I think so because then it's the best of both worlds, right? Like, but the e-bike. But and it'd be the a hardtail. It would still be a hardtail, wouldn't it? That's fine though. We just. Your poor mm. knees. Those gaps. We make do. No, because I'm, <laughs> oh, I'm going to land them so cleanly, so smoothly. My knees won't even feel a thing. <laughs> I love you. your optimism. <laughs> hell yeah. Oh, I'm going to be there for the rest of my life. So <laughs> okay, so be. your next thing you get to choose is a book to take with you. I'm tempted to say it should be like Knee Surgery 101 or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, a what book. book would you take? Like a book or a magazine? Mm-hmm. Mm. There's this one, one magazine I would definitely take. Obviously, single track world, you know. <laughs> well done, Come well on. done. <laughs> We're gonna give you that points. one anyway. So you ah, get okay, cool. We get ah, okay, we get ah, okay. So I get one day mechanic, a year subscription, lifetime uh, subscription, lifetime yeah, subscription. Yeah, lifetime subscription. So you keep getting to see what's happening in the rest of the world. Through okay, the that's track. Cool. Yeah. Um, and then one other book. Ooh. Is that a question? You know, I can't remember the last time I read a book. Much that that probably sounds so bad. Um, honestly, do you know what? I'd take a colouring book. A colouring book? Yeah, because, wait, look. Okay. Like, yeah, because, yeah, pass a colouring book. You pass the time. You can create your own story with it. You know, you'd have to find things on the island to make those colours because unless you're going to give me paint as well, I'm just chancing my luck here, um, <laughs> or colouring pens, but I'd get a colouring book, yeah. I mean, okay. it's nice and simple, you know, you can, yeah. And you can also take one album with you. I know you're too young to mm. actually do albums, really, but you Pretty can't much, take yeah. Spotify, so I'm afraid <sighs> you're going to have to narrow it down. To oh, album. music album. I was there thinking a photo album. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> um, music, music album. Oh, music album. Yeah. damn! Oh my god, I don't know who listens to albums anymore. Exactly, I know. that's like a CD, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, an album. I'm having a quick look on my Spotify to see what's up there. I'd, I'd, I'd go for like a like a, a Burner Boy album because it's like good vibes on an island. Burner Boy, I think it'd be a a nice vibe. Okay. Uh, it's kind of Afro style ish. I'm know. glad you're describing it because I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> oh, it's good. Well. No, it's good music. It's good. It's like it's very nice. Um, it's not like it's not rap or anything. It's kind of like a a bit of a mix of like kind of Afro beats ish style. It's it's a good vibe. Okay. Upbeat, very positive, good energy. You know. Um, and I think that's that's key for for the music that you're gonna listen to for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, well, yeah. you're making me feel quite old at this point already. But no. um, uh, the uh, clothing and trainer uh, sponsor that you have, beginning with an N, how do you pronounce it? <laughs> Nike. Thank you. I it's pronounce Nike. it Nike. And every time I say it, my kids go, it's Nike. So it's not I'm Nike. Not, I'm going to tell them. Yeah, I spoke you can tell to a Nike sponsored athlete. <laughs> yeah, well, sadly not anymore sponsored. <laughs> but oh. we was for three years and it was the best greatest three years and I'm happy to not be on them. I'm happy to that I was on them. I'm sad I'm not on it. Whatever. It was a great time. But it is Nike, a hundred percent Nike. Because when I would do adverts or any videos for them and I'd have to be like, Yeah, so Nike, they'd be like, cut, cut. Redo it's Nike. I have to say, even in like podcasts like this, like when I was signed to them, I had to say Nike. Like they were like wow. on on it with me. Like it's Nike. I'm gonna so, tell yeah. my kids I am right. You can officially <laughs> say yeah, and it's official as well. Like genuine official. Yeah. 
Oh, well, last question then. Oh, you can take on. one luxury item with you. You can't use it to help you escape from the island. So no paddle boards and no communicating with the rest of the world either. No mobile phones. The one luxury item. Yeah. I'm t the, the listeners can't see this, but I'm showing you. But I will explain what it is. I'll take my good friend here, Dora, right here. Um, okay. Um, I would say so I would. It's a door. It's a, it's a door, with eyes and a face. It, I guess it identifies as a woman in a sense, but like it's a door. We call her. We call her Dora. Um, and it's been a a key part of bike life. It's um, it's got a lot of fans. This door. This door is pretty famous. Um, and we put it up in any location we want, and it's then a an obstacle for for the kids to swerve. Oh. Um. So if I'm lucky, you know, I can bring that item and I have a an extra obstacle for my for my downhill concrete tarmac strip on my desert island. I can have a door at the bottom that I can, you know, get around. And then if anyone ever does come and visit, we have something, you know, a door with. And you know, you could probably use it for many other things too. So you could pretend that there was a portal to another world on the other side of it. I could just pretend I had some privacy on my island, just put yeah. a door, you know. <laughs> but yeah, that door is, um, I think the door, you know, because any other luxury item, you're going to have it. And if it's any, some sort of luxury, you're going to want, you're going to want more of that, or you're going to want to develop off that. But a door, like, you're going to just be happy with it, isn't it? Like, it's a simple door. I can I can keep adding artwork to it. I can just keep making it look better. I can, you know, with the colouring pens that I'm hoping you give me with my colouring book, you know. It persuades me, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the door and the colouring book need the pens. So. <laughs> I sound like such a little kid. I said a door. <laughs> my two items would be a door and a colouring book. Yeah, I don't know. Otherwise though, what what have other people said for luxury items? Some people want mean? like woodworking tools and stuff because loads of people have said they want to like learn to make stuff out of wood. Like, Boring. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I applaud your like, yeah, if you have luxury, just want more, just be happy yeah. with what you've got. Kind of, that's, a, that's a very nice philosophical outlook on life. It's just simple then as well because it's like, well, cool, just deal with what I've got. But if I've got something that, you know, that might break or think, uh, or, or I'm going to want a better saw when my one gets weak or something. No, I just got a door, innit? Like, what more okay. do you want? What less do you want? Probably not. <laughs> well, in that case, I think it's just about time that you go and build that electric <laughs> C100 because <laughs> the, the ship is coming in to take oh, you no. out the door off to oh, no. desert islands. Thank you very much for chatting to us before you it's, go. It's been a pleasure and uh, I'm hoping you come and visit one day when when you bring me my my sub, my year long my my lifelong subscription. Hopefully you hand deliver each one. Oh I hand deliver. That's what I'm expecting. Oh, okay, no. we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. All right.